Welcome back to The Hot Seat with Emily Diala and Dr. Viviana Coles. I am Emily. And I am Dr. Viviana Coles. And so today we're going to be talking about a big topic that we could not possibly cover all today, but it's going to be sexual desire. Exactly. So we broke this, we're calling it a series essentially, and we broke this series down into four different segments. And in each segment, we will talk about a different component of sexual desire because would you agree that it's one of the most complicated issues that we It's one of the most complicated and it's Mm -hmm. one of the most common, which is why we want to start off talking about it. Right. It affects men, it affects women, it affects Mm -hmm. everyone in between. Yeah, exactly. Um, So today, we're going to focus on the differences and similarities between male and female sexual desire. Yeah, so where do we start? Let's let's talk about women. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about women and let's talk about what tends to happen when people call us to schedule an appointment and it has something to do with sexual desire. So a lot of times what I notice is that couples will identify one person as having the problem. And usually this is the person with the lower sexual desire. I prefer to call it a discrepancy in sexual desire. Right, because what may be low to someone is super high to someone else. So what we talk about is that gap between two partners. Right. uh, When one person has it just a little bit more than the other, that discrepancy could be here or it could be here but it's always a problem. Exactly. So, you know, most couples, there's going to be a little bit of a higher desire and a lower desire partner. Rarely do we get with someone with whom we match up 100% of the time. And all the time. And all the time. And under all circumstances of life. And in a long-term monogamous (laughs) relationship. So there's just too many factors that come into play. Um, Couples run into problems when that gap really widens and when the discrepancy starts to feel more unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Um, But first and foremost for couples, again, I think it's important to depathologize and talk about it more as a difference between them as opposed to the lower desire one is the one with the problem. And let's do a little caveat here. Just because we're talking about sexual desire discrepancy doesn't mean that everyone has a problem that has Mm -hmm. a sexual desire discrepancy. There are lots of couples that we just won't hear about and won't hear from Uh that are managing it really well. Exactly. Who are managing and posting and working through these issues on their own. We're going to talk about our experience with clients who actually come Mm -hmm. in to see us because it is a problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we can also talk about is the idea that sexual desire is not something that is stagnant or that stays the same Mm -hmm. or that should stay the same throughout your lifespan, especially with women. There's a lot of hormones that have a big uh, impact on how we're feeling right. and life experiences mm-hmm. and how we're feeling about our bodies, which is you what know, we're going to talk about. I think women are very quickly, they're more likely to blame their hormones. Oh, let me go get my hormones checked. And, what and we, we know that, right? Yeah, it's easy to rule that out. But what we know now, there was a comprehensive study that came out not too long ago that found out that hormones was like one of the, the <laughs> least likely reasons why women were complaining of low sexual desire. It doesn't really influence us as much as we like to think it does. Exactly. From early on, especially going through puberty, we understand that our hormones have this really intense impact on us, Mm -hmm. uh, on mood, on our physical activity level and energy. And so we tend to go there. And you know what? A lot of the medical practice Uh and a lot of medicine uh, tells us that we should take a look at that. And you know what? We as sex therapists do encourage people to go out and get their hormones checked at least every six months because it can have a deep impact. But most of the time, we do find out that it's psychological or relational. Right. And I like to, de- I think sex has become very medicalized. And what we know is that sex is not just a medical thing, especially as humans, you have to take the context into consideration. Now, there do tend to be some gender differences. Again, there was a comprehensive study that looked at the differences between um, frequency or, or the desire of. Um, Sexual activity. Right, exactly, around the world. And they found that men tend to have a little bit of a higher desire globally than women. Probably that's in large part because they have higher testosterone levels. So hormones do come into play a little bit, but but I also find that it's also the way that we're socialized. Oh, totally. Women are not socialized at as such a young age, mm-hmm. like a lot of men, right. to prioritize sex and sexuality, mm-hmm. to, priori- to prioritize their own individual sexuality. Exactly. Women aren't really encouraged to explore their sexuality until they're at least in college. And by right. that time, men have been exploring their own since they were 11. Right. So they've got at least a decade on us. Um, I think that that makes a real big difference when they're coming mm-hmm. in to having a, a heterosexual couple where there's a male and a right. female, they're going to have different expectations for their own sexuality mm-hmm. and as far, and their relationship sexuality as well. Exactly. Um, 
I think that when it also comes to desire and what people are coming in for, mm -hmm. we tend to say, and, and most people when we're out talking, they tend to say that women tend to have a lower sex drive. You were just talking mm -hmm. about it. Again, maybe not so much, and, and it's, not all, it's not the case all the time. I know that in my practice, I tend to see more of a difference um, with women having the lower sex drive than their mm -hmm. male counterparts. Not always the case, and we'll right. talk more about that as well. Mm -hmm. But what about at your practice? I would say it's probably a 60-40 split. Okay. And couples are really surprised, or they think that they're very alone when mm -hmm. it's the guy who has the lower drive. Uh, desire because again we are socialized both men and women are socialized to think that men should be ready to go whenever All the time. they're like robots. You know, exactly that they're like I didn't robots. know this but men are robots right <laughs> and that's simply not the case it's a myth and so you know a lot of what I do is help couples break those myths and and I do a lot of psychosexual education on what is a reasonable expectation to have and, and also how desire works and we as therapists we call that normalizing we want people mm -hmm. to understand that they are not the only people going through this issue and they can take from our experiences as therapists that see this a lot more often than maybe right. they do, um, especially because this isn't a topic that a lot of men want to talk about. They don't. They Most don't. women feel pretty in good company when they right. talk about, oh, I just don't feel like it, or oh, I just don't want you know, mm -hmm. to have sex as often as They're you They're expected does. to say that. They're expected to say that uh -huh. it's okay. We do get encouraged a lot more now by right. our friends and girlfriends uh -huh. to say, okay, well maybe we need to do something to shake things up to yeah. get that sex drive up a little bit. But with men, I find that they do mm -hmm. feel a lot more alone and their female counterparts mm -hmm. will also give them a tougher time. They do, and so they carry a lot of shame around this. And shame, if you think of one thing that can kill desire it's faster, total. I mean, shame is a total libido killer. So I really work on moving that shame out and creating space. I'm, I'm of the mind that we have so much emotional energy, and so or space, I should say. And if that space uh, is filled up with shame or anxiety stressors, or low self-esteem, yeah. stressors, and you just don't have room for what you want to feel, which is you know, connection and passion and joy. Absolutely. And so we got to move those, those debilitating feelings out first. And let's talk a little bit about mood killers. We want to hear about what y'all have to say about yes. what makes you least in the mood and what mm -hmm. gets you most in the mood. Uh -huh. And that can be for sexual desire, with a partner, by yourself, right. whatever it is. So at the end of each segment, we are going to ask you guys to do a challenge for us. So today's challenge is exactly that. We want you to write in the comments section or you can email us um, about when you feel most in the mood for sex versus when you're least in the mood. And get creative because I, I want y'all to think about this. We want y'all to wonder you know, hey, I haven't thought about this. Right. There's a lot of really obvious things that get you in the mood or that are turn-offs. Exactly. Let's hear about everything. Uh -huh. uh, emotional, psychological, physical, all that good yeah. stuff. All right, so make sure you hashtag Hot Seat. That's H-O-T-S-E-A-T. And we'll see you soon. Tune in.